Hello, my name is Imina Lemkul. I'm a research associate at the Faculty of Orthodox Theology, University of Belgrade. The topic of my presentation is Constantine in the Mathesis of Firmicus Maternus. More specifically, I will focus on the fact that text makes reference to Nysus, modern day niche, where we would be giving our presentations were we not prevented by the current circumstances. Mathesius Libri Octo by Julius Firmicus Maternus is one of the most complete astrological treatises written in Latin that has come down to us from the classical period. It is also the earliest source to mention Nysus as the birthplace of Constantine the Great. There has been much debate in historiography over the date of its composition since the text itself presents us with several contradictory remarks. However, two statements allow us to determine the time frame in which it was written. The mention of a solar eclipse in 334 and a laudatory passage written to the ruling emperor Constantine inscribed toward the end of the first book, which makes us conclude that it must have been written during Constantine's lifetime, that is before the end of the year of 337. The passage goes as follows. The Lord and our Augustus, emperor of the whole world, the pious, fortunate, and far-seeing Constantine, the oldest son of the deified Constantius, a prince of august and venerable memory, who was chosen to rescue the world from the rule of tyrants and to suppress evils at home by the favor of his own majesty, so that through him the squalor of servitude might be washed away and the gifts of secure freedom restored to us, and so that we might cast off the yoke of captivity from our already tired and oppressed necks. Always fighting for our liberty, he was never deceived by the fortune of war, that most uncertain thing among human vicissitudes. Born in Nisus, from the first stage of his age, he held the rudders of empire, which he had acquired under favorable auspices, and he sustains the Roman world by the salubrious moderation of his rule, so that it enjoys an increase of its everlasting good fortune. This translation is according to Timothy Barnes, who amended this section of the text, since modern editions repeat the error of the 11th century scribe in the oldest preserved manuscript of Mathesis, where it is written, Constantinus Silicit Maximus Divi Constantini Filius, instead of Constanti Filius. However, the name of Constantius is often confused with the name of Constantine in medieval sources. And that mistake has led some researchers to assume that the emperor to whom Firmicus Maternus gives praise is in fact Constantine II, the son of Constantine the Great, which would place the composition of Mathesis at a later date. Yet the mention of Nysus as the birthplace of the emperor brings us to conclusion that the Constantine in question is undoubtedly Constantine the Great. We know that Constantine II was born in Arles, Constantius II at Sirmium, and we're uncertain of Constance's birthplace. Yet since another source, the anonymous Origo Constantini Imperatoris, chronologically close to Mathesis, also mentions Nysus as the place of Constantine's birth, we can be certain that Firmicus Maternus is indeed referring to Constantine the Great. Since Origo was written shortly after Constantine's death, that makes Mathesis the older of the two sources. The laudatory passage we quoted is found in a chapter devoted to the influence of the stars on the physiognomy and disposition of men based on the place they were born, and the author uses the example of the emperor to, illust to illustrate his point. Praise to the emperor was a literary convention in classical writing. That it is found in the section dealing with planetary effects on the people in different geographic zones may be more than a coincidence. Following this passage, Firmicus invokes each of the planets, as well as the sun and moon, and beseeches them to aid and protect Constantine and his sons. By virtue of the harmony of your rule and obedient to the highest God who gives you never-ending lordship, vouchsafe that Constantine, the most great princeps, and his unconquered children, our lords and Caesars, rule over our children and our children's children through endless ages, so that freed from all misfortune, the human race may enjoy everlasting peace and prosperity. 
The fact that Firmicus characterizes the planets as obedient to the supreme god has been noted by Timothy Burns, who considers that the author is referring here to the Christian god. In 343, Firmicus Maternus wrote a Christian polemic on the error of profane religions, in which he urges the emperors Constantius and Constance to suppress pagan rites in the western parts of the Roman Empire. In earlier scholarship, it was doubted that the author of an astrological manual could be the author of a staunch attack on pagan religions, and it was contested that both works were written by Firmicus. However, stylistic analysis have proven that indeed they were written by the same person. The tract is characterized by violent rhetoric, which has been interpreted as a sign of zeal of a recent convert. Yet there are those such as Lynn Thorndike who believe that Maternus was Christian even at the time of his writing of Mathesis. In both works, he uses the term, term sumus deus, which is often found in the extant letters and documents of Constantine, as well as in the writings of Lactantius. But it was also used by a great number of Romans, from those worshipping Jupiter, Demetrius, Hermetists, and Neoplatonists. Application of this term should be viewed as a part of a conscious effort to appeal to a broad religious audience, in the case of Constantine and Lactantius, and Firmicus himself. Throughout the Throughout the Mathesis, Firmicus talks of multiple gods. Hence, we should refrain or at least be very cautious from making any judgments on his religious adherence during the writing of Mathesis. It is most likely that he did not want to alienate himself or his subject matter from any potential readers. It is possible that he was leaning towards Christianity already, or it may be that he wanted to appeal to those in the highest instances of power who had Christian proclivities, such as the Emperor Constantine himself. Producing a thoroughly Christian version of astrology would have been a highly risky endeavor since opposing attitudes towards astrology and divination in general have been expressed in the writings of numerous early church fathers and prohibitions on astrological activities among Christian believers is found already in Didache. However, we have evidence of many Christians practicing astrology as we can surmise from the complaints and condemnations of those same church fathers that testify of astrological practice among their congregation. There are also preserved horoscopes of persons with Christian names and epitaphs showing zodiacal signs and Christian symbols. While there were some heretical groups which tried to incorporate astrological theories into Christian teaching, there were many converts who simply continued consulting astrologers. Some researchers have pointed out how Firmicus aimed at presenting the practicing of astrology as respectable and lofty out of concern for the reception and survival of his profession in the increasingly Christianizing society. At the end of the second book, he gives a series of instructions to a practicing astrologer on how to conduct himself. Be modest, upright, sober, eat little, be content with few goods. Avoid plots, at all times shun disturbances and violence. He even suggests what kind of life he should lead. Have a wife, a home, many sincere friends. He instructs him to develop a virtuous character and to abide by moral and official laws. The laws applying specifically to astrologers were imposed and regulated by an edict issued by Augustus in AD 11, in which it was demanded of them to perform their consultations in the open and in the presence of a witness. Also, they were prohibited from speculating on the time of death of any person. Firmicus is reiterating these restrictions when he advises the prospective astrologer. See that you give your responses publicly in a clear voice so that nothing may be asked of you which is not allowed either to ask or to answer. Further on, he warns him not to answer on the life of emperor and the republic. Beware of replying to anyone asking about the condition of the republic or the life of the Roman emperor. For it is not right, nor is it permitted, that from wicked curiosity we learn anything about the condition of the republic but it is a wicked man and one worthy of all punishment, who when asked gives a response about the destiny of the emperor, because the astrologer is able neither to find out nor to say anything. Here, 
Firmicus is not only advising against consultations on imperial and political topics simply out of moral or legal concerns, but he's claiming that these matters are in fact impossible to predict. In fact, no astrologer is able to find out anything true about the destiny of the emperor, for the emperor alone is not subject to the course of the stars, and in his fate alone the stars have no power of decreeing. Since he is master of the whole universe, his destiny is governed by the judgment of the highest god, since the whole world is subject to the power of the emperor, and he himself is also considered among the number of the gods whom the supreme power has set up to create and conserve all things. As Frederick Kramer observed, this was a departure from the traditional approach in which the fate of the ruler was predetermined and foretold by the stars. In fact, some of the emperors had used their horoscopes or nativities, to use a more astrologically accurate term, to proclaim their glorious destiny and dispel any rumors of their impending fall or approaching death. That was the case with Augustus, who made his horoscope public in the same edict of AD 11, or Septimius Severus, who had the ceilings of reception halls in his palace painted with his horoscope. However, Firmicus here presents us with a novel cosmological conception of a sovereign who is above the law of the stars and subordinate only to the supreme god. Yet, despite Emperor's alleged exemption from astrological determinism, Firmicus shows inconsistencies throughout the text. Would he list positions and aspects of planets in an individual's chart which indicate that the person will become an emperor or otherwise be involved with an emperor, arousing his goodwill or contempt? Even in the case of Constantine, Firmicus relates how the emperor received his rule under favorable auspices and calls him fortunate. He directs his prayer for the emperor and his sons to the planets. In an astrological chart of a certain man, he indicates which aspects caused the emperor to pass sentence on this individual, who was well known to him and his friend, Lolianus Mavortius, to whom he dedicated his work. It was at his request that Firmicus composed his work. As Firmicus mentions in the preface of the first book, at the time they met, Mavortius was a governor of Campania. When he commissioned the work from Firmicus, he was appointed governor of the entire East by the wise and respected judgment of our Lord and Emperor Constantine Augustus. And at the time Firmicus completed it, he claims that Mavortius was proconsul and designated consul ordinarius. Since Mavortius' life and career is well attested in the sources, all of the positions mentioned by Firmicus can can be corroborated, except for the consulship, which is evidenced at a much later date, in 355. This has also been a source of confusion and suspicion regarding the date of the writing of the Mathesis. However, the most probable explanation is that Mavorshev was denied consulship at the time he was nominated and later appointed consul. It may be that the death of Emperor Constantine postponed his election or that his consulship was revoked by Constantine's successors. It has even been suggested by Noah Lansky that he, the dedication of this astrological manual could have affected Mavorshus' election. Whatever the case may be, Mavorshus was certainly a high-profile and aspiring individual whose career was influenced by decisions of the highest instances of power in the state and the political circumstances surrounding it. Thus, it seems highly likely that any inquiries regarding his own future would involve calculation of nativities of most important political actors, such as the emperor and his sons. Before devoting himself to the writing of the astrological handbook, Firmicus abandoned his legal practice, as he claims in the fourth book of Mathesis. Being a lawyer, he was very well aware of legal restrictions on astrological activities imposed by the Augustan Edict of AD 11. He could have been familiar with cases in which accusations on the illicit astrological inquiries led to the charges of treason, some of which are listed in Kramer's Astrology in Roman Law and Politics. Thus, we can conclude that Firmicus's treatment of astrological influence on the life of the emperor as expressed in the second book of Mathesis was merely a rhetorical device one which was meant to flatter the emperor, perhaps 
conform to his religious inclinations, and most importantly, to absolve Mavorshas of any suspicions of being involved in predict predictions concerning the fate of the emperor. Firmicus clearly believed that emperor's actions were affected by the course of the stars, as we can discern from the remainder of the text. It may be that among various astrological positions in an individual's chart that he inter interprets in his book, Firmicus had revealed some of the characteristics of Constantine's horoscope. In that context, we can also interpret the mention of Nisus in the text. The birthplace of an individual was a necessary information for the calculation of their nativity chart, and it may be the reason why Firmicus chose to insert the praise to the emperor in the section discussing the effect of the stars on people born in different geographic zones. In my contribution to the conference proceedings, I will further investigate this hypothesis by analy analyzing the listed aspects that may be pointing to an imperial horoscope. Thank you for your attention.